Is the pig man really a skunk ape? Or is the skunk ape really a pig man? Hey, I'm Niyama Finn. When it comes to the legend of the pig man, you'll have to speak in plural. There are two distinctly different variations of the story. First, and for me, the far less interesting, so you'll have to forgive me if I don't spend a great deal of time on it. There's the circus story. <laughs> ah, yes, there's always a circus, isn't there? I was on DAX Machina a week or so ago talking about werewolf springs, and we started comparing legends that begin with a circus train derailment. Much like, my dog ate my homework! It seems to be the old standby. By the way, if you'd like to have me do a story about Werewolf Springs on my channel, let me know down in the comments section. Otherwise, you can find a version of it on Cameron Buckner's What If It's True podcast. Like Werewolf Springs, one variation of the legend of the Pigman begins with that proverbial circus. Not a train derailment, mind you, but a circus just the same. It seems there was an animal trainer who worked for the circus training pigs. He wasn't a very nice man. In fact, he was quite cruel to the animals he trained. But he was good at his job, and this was a long time ago when people didn't seem to mind so much if animals were treated badly, so no one ever did anything about the pig man. He eventually got old and decided to retire. That's when he moved to Georgia and built a strange little house into the side of a mountain. There he kept his pigs, and in some accounts he kept pigeons too and he continued in his cruel ways until one day the pigs revolted against him, killed him, and um, ate him. <laughs> the pigman's ghost is now said to haunt that area of Georgia. For generations, young people have dared each other to approach the house and try to summon the pigman, so I assume at least some of this account is true. And I admit there is a certain level of intrigue in that story. I know I didn't do it justice here. Maybe someday I'll revisit it and explore the ghost of the cruel pig man more deeply. In the meantime, there's another story of another pig man that I personally find far more captivating, and I hope you do too. It began in Ware County, Georgia in 1829. Actually, I suppose it goes back much further than that. There's a legend there deep in the Okefenokee Swamp of an enchanted island as told by the Creek Indians. On this island lived a race of people who were much larger than normal man, and as such much stronger and able to live a lot longer. These people, the creek said, were the most beautiful anyone had ever seen. The princess of that island was named Amana, and she was the goddess of the sun. Ready for a rabbit hole? The name Okefenokee is generally interpreted to mean the land of the trembling earth. This is not true. The Muskegee words for trembling and earth are entirely different. Because of this, many have interpreted it to mean bubbling water. Close, but no cigar. According to Richard L. Thornton, an actual Creek Indian and a member of the Coeta Creek tribe, and who provides a long, twisted explanation, as near as I can tell, says Oki means water and Finoki means to move back and forth. And here's another quick one for you that has very little to do with the story, but I thought was kind of interesting. Burt Reynolds famously told a lot of people he was a Cherokee from Waycross. There are no Cherokee in his family history. When he went to play football for the Florida State Seminoles, he changed his story to say that he was a Seminole from Waycross. The idea came to him when he spent two years in Waycross with a relative it probably springs from the fact that Pernell Roberts was a real Creek Indian from Waycross and Burt Reynolds is idle. Some of you might be old enough to remember Pernell Roberts from the TV series Trapper John M.D. And some of us are even old enough to remember him from the TV show Bonanza. The rest of you will just have to take my word for it. He was once a famous actor. Back to June of 1829. That part of Georgia was in the middle of a long dry spell. In the swamplands, that means the water recedes, and sometimes it means treasures can be found. For two men and a boy, it was an excuse to find the legendary sacred island of the Creek people somewhere in the heart of the Okefenokee. 
For two weeks, the two men and the boy explored and wandered through the Oki Finoki in search of a place where the people were beautiful beyond compare. And with it, I'm sure, they expected to find treasure. But when they stumbled across a footprint, they decided some treasures aren't worth seeking. It was a single print, something that might not otherwise have shaken a body, except that this print was 18 inches long and 9 inches across. Clearly, it was the print of a giant bigger than any of them would have ever thought to exist. They considered whoever belonged to that print must have been well over six feet tall. Considering the fact that the average American male at that time was a mere five foot seven inches, that estimate must have seemed rather extreme. However, even if the foot to height ratio for this being was only six to one, it would have actually been around nine feet tall half again as tall as they imagined. Regardless, it was enough to turn them around and send them back to the safety of their homes. Word got around about the footprint, and pretty soon there were a few people who wanted to see for themselves just exactly what could have made it. In typical, poorly educated, highly superstitious fashion, they determined that whoever, or whatever, was stomping around that swamp needed to be hunted down and dealt with. Nine men volunteered for the mission. Together, they girded their loins and ventured into the mire. It wasn't long before they, too, found an oversized footprint, and then another, and then another. They tracked the prints through the muddy, mosquito-infested sauna for days, camping by night in clearings and on ridges. Then, two of the men had a sighting. A massive, ferocious beast stepped into the clearing right in front of them. Startled, they both raised their guns and fired without thinking. The creature released a deafening scream that rattled the plant life, stirred the murky waters, and vibrated the men's chests before advancing on them with an angry glare that told them they were about to see their last. The remaining seven men came into the clearing at that moment and established a tight formation against the beast, rifles raised ready for combat. Undaunted, the beast approached, intent on taking its revenge on the intruders. Seven rifles emptied into that thing but it didn't fall. Instead, it grabbed one of the men and twisted his head until it snapped clean off his neck. Throwing the twitching body aside, it grabbed another, tearing him limb from limb until his lifeless body was also discarded. These men did their best to fight the mammoth, but they were helpless against it. It grabbed a third man and didn't let go until his head and various limbs were disengaged from his torso. A fourth man and then a fifth each died in much the same way. The remaining four managed to escape the slaughter and run back through the swamp to share their tale with their fellow settlers. Did the monster die? Some say it succumbed to the gunshot wounds. Others say the blast had little to no effect on it. The survivors described the creature as being massively tall and covered in matted dark hair. It had long arms, huge feet, and wore a ferocious scowl. Most of all, it smelled worse than a skunk. Although it appeared human in many ways, it walked on two feet, it had two arms and two legs, and its head was shaped relatively similar to that of a man's. They said it had a snout that resembled that of a pig's. And thus, the legend of the pig man was born. This was not the last the people who lived around the Okefenokee Swamp would see the pig man. For nearly 200 years, sightings have been reported in the area of something that resembles what today we would call a skunk ape. It's easy to imagine such a creature living in the recesses of the land of trembling earth or bubbling water or water that moves back and forth, depending on which definition you prefer. Ancient cypress trees wade knee-deep into the black water. Alligators raise their heads to the surface to stare menacingly at passing boats. Turtles rest in groups on fallen logs. Frogs croak dark drumbeats to the melody of chirping crickets. Mosquitoes swarm and spin with tornadic fervor to form black clouds of bloodthirsty masses. You don't breathe the air in a place like that. You drink it. In 1972, a 14-year-old boy was exploring the swamp in Stephen Foster State Park when he found out exactly how dangerous the Ogifinoki can be. He was camping there with his family and had decided to do a little exploring. As he walked along looking for insects and spiders, small furry creatures and alligators, he began to notice something was walking behind him. 
He wasn't worried, though. He was sure it was just his brothers and sisters having a little fun with him. Soon, he figured, they'd get close and then they'd jump out and try to scare him. I'll show them, he thought. I'll let them get close and then I'll be the one to jump out and scare them. He listened while he walked as the footsteps got closer. Once they got close enough, he jumped behind a tree and waited. But instead of seeing his siblings coming along the path, Something that he described as being a cross between a chimpanzee and a little man was coming toward him. It saw him and let out an ear-shattering scream. The boy, stunned by what he was seeing and terrified by that awful howl, stood for a moment and stared at the odd creature. It was all the time the thing needed. It pounced on the boy and knocked him to the ground. Suddenly, he found himself in a struggle for his life as the creature bared its teeth and tried to sink them into his throat. He fought at it with all he had, desperate to escape, but somehow knowing he didn't have a chance. Tears began to well up in his eyes as he thought about his family. His strength was dwindling. He didn't tell his mom and dad that he loved them. There wasn't much fight left in him. He never got to hug his brothers and sisters one last time. His sight began to blur. Would his friends miss him? At that moment, the boy's parents, who had heard the frightening scream, began to shout for the boy. The thing that had him pinned to the ground, and that was only seconds from ending his life, raised its head and sniffed the air. Then it stood up, walked to the canal, swam across, and disappeared into the vegetation on the other side. The boy, uncertain of how or why, had survived. That was the last official sighting of the pig man I could find in my internet searches. At least the cryptid one. I'm really going to have to revisit that other pig man someday and do a whole video on him. None of the books I own mention such a creature at all. To be honest, I stumbled across the pig man story completely by accident while researching something entirely different. One thing led to another, and the next thing I knew, I was elbow deep in pig snouted cryptid stories. That pig snout got my attention. I imagine, in a world devoid of things like gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans, the closest thing to a flat-nosed primate in 1829 would have been a pig snout. After all, the lowland gorilla wasn't discovered until 1847, and then it was only a skull. The mountain gorilla wasn't recognized until 1902. Sure, Europeans had known about chimpanzees and orangutans for a lot longer than that, but the men in that hunting party weren't exactly world explorers, so they probably had never seen nor possibly even heard of any such animal. There's been a lot of debate over the years as to whether Bigfoot's nose is human-esque or gorilla-shaped. The answer, of course, is that there are two different species and subspecies of Bigfoot, one that comes to mind in particular and that might best fit the description of having a snout like a pig is the gugway because it's said to look similar to a mandrel and the mandrel's nose very closely resembles that of a pig's. Oh well. I find myself shaking my head every time I start searching for cryptid sightings anywhere outside of Washington, Oregon or Northern California. They always begin the same way. Although most Bigfoot sightings occur in the American Northwest, there have been a few. Yeah, right. I think the problem lies in a complete misunderstanding of the southern vernacular. They don't call them Bigfoot down here. Sit in a crowded roadside cafe in this part of the country and you might hear a farmer whisper about a booger getting into his chickens or a skunk ape chasing his cattle. Boogers, woolly boogers, critters, screamers, skunk apes, these are the names we hear in this part of the country. So, maybe there aren't as many Bigfoot sightings east of the Mississippi, but there are a heck of a lot more of those other names seen around here than there ever were up in the Cascades. Maybe that's why there haven't been any pigman sightings in recent years. He's still out there. He just changed his name. I'm Neoma Finn.